Josh Blackman is an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law and specializes in constitutional law, the US Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. And finally, Alyssa Steglich is the legal director of the Immigrant Rights Program at the American Friends Service Committee here in Newark. American Friends offers legal services and advocates for immigrants who are in detention, facing deportation, or are in need of protection. We greatly appreciate our speakers taking their time out to come, and we look forward to an insightful and informative discussion. I'll now turn it over to our moderator, Professor Tim Raphael, who is the director of the Center for Migration and, global, and the Global City at Rutgers Newark. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Thanks for everyone else who helped organize this um, really timely and uh, very interesting panel. Because we have some time limitations, we're going to try and stick to a fairly um, rigid schedule here, and I'm going to try uh, to facilitate that um, and otherwise stay out of the way as much as possible. Each of the panelists is going to give a very brief um, overview of their particular area of expertise in relationship to President Obama's executive action, and then we'll have a very brief uh, conversation among the three panelists, um, and then open up the floor to questions from all of you, which hopefully will be the majority of the time uh, left. Um, so Professor Blackman is going to start, and I have uh, introductions for what all three of them are going to talk about, but in the interest of time, since they're going to talk about it, I think I will just introduce Professor Blackman, Josh Blackman. Hello everyone, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Welcome to be here. Uh, I'm actually from Staten Island, so this is a very easy talk for you to get to, so I'm very gracious for the opportunity. Thank you to the federal side and the ACS Immigration Society for inviting me. Today we are talking about executive action, and specifically about executive action to affect immigration. And the question we want to address today is, are the President's actions constitutional? So first, what exactly was done? Um, as the introduction mentioned, in November of 2014, President Obama and his Homeland Security Director released a memo announcing what they called DAPA, Deferred Action for Parental Accountability, as it became to be known. And this said, with respect to roughly 4 million people, the government would defer the deportation. It wouldn't say they didn't deport them, it said we will defer the deportation. And as a consequence of giving those deferred actions, these people received work authorization, uh, they received income tax credit, and various other benefits which were provided under federal law. I am not so much concerned about all that ancillary stuff, right? My primary and sole question is was this decision consistent with what we know as prosecutorial discretion? Was it within the authority of the statutes of Congress to present to say, I will grant deferred action to 4 million people? Okay. And to answer this, we need to look to our favorite document, the Constitution. So hopefully everyone <laughs> took one on the way in. If you didn't, you should take one now. And you turn to Article 2, Section 3. You may never study this one in common law, but it's there, right? It says, the president shall, shall means must, the president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And this is what's called the take care clause. The president shall faithfully execute the laws. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, was DAPA, was this policy consistent with the faithful execution of the laws? And I think if we just look at the plain text of the take care clause, it tells us a couple things, right? Shall means must, it's a command, right? You must act with care. This is similar to how in torts we have a duty of care. We must proceed not recklessly, not negligently, but with care. Third, what is the object of these duties? The laws. The president must execute the laws of Congress. And how must he do so? For faithfulness. This is a duty that must be discharged in good faith. So generally, this clause is incited by the president to expand power, say he needs to defend the country, and this or that. But here we have a new phenomenon. We actually have a president saying, I will not enforce various aspects of the law. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is this consistent with the discretion afforded by Congress, right? If Congress has afforded the president this discretion to uh, 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 not enforce the law in a certain manner, then it's perfectly lawful. If Congress has not afforded this discretion, then the actions are unconstitutional. So I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of immigration law, and my <coughs> colleague will, will do a much better job with me than this. Uh, but for now, suffice to say that the immigration laws give a lot of discretion to the president. It, it's an undisputed fact 
that they're only uh, that they're roughly uh, enough money to deport maybe four hundred thousand people a year. That's a fraction of the number of people who are unlawfully, right? It's it's impossible with the given resources to just remove every single person who could be removed. And, and I, I will not dispute that. I think that, 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 that that's an indisputable fact. Um, but what I will discuss is that Congress also hasn't said that prospectively you need to license unlawful presence. Okay? And this instance, what we're using is called deferred action. Okay? And what deferred action means is not that we won't deport you. That's not what the government's saying. They're saying we will defer your deportation to some point in the future, maybe never, maybe now, but you know, it may happen later. So it's not actually halting deportations, as the government says, at any point they can revoke this. They won't, but in theory, they, they could do that. Okay? So the question is, how has this deferred action been used in the past, right? Has this deferred action been used in a manner consistent with the president's time? One of the cornerstones of constitutional law and executive power is saying, is the president's actions consistent with precedent? Is the president's action consistent with what Congress has acquiesced to? And here I think the answer is no. In virtually every instance where deferred action is being used, it was with the consent of Congress in one form or another. And let me use a very easy example. So in 2005, Hurricane Katrina struck the Gulf. Okay? So imagine you were a foreign student studying at the same university in New Orleans. You had your credit loan, you were registered for the semester, and then boom, hurricane struck. Your school shut down. You no longer have the requisite number of credits to keep your visa. As a result, you are lawfully present and subject to removal. So what did the president do? President Bush said, okay, we'll give you four months to enroll at another university, get your credit load back up, and then we'll reassess and give you the visa and whatever paperwork you have to have, right? This was deferred action. And in this sense, deferred action operated as a bridge. You had a status, you lost it, and then you got to get to the university, right? In every single instance of the uh, government cites their memo, which deferred action is used, it's used in this bridge manner. These are people who have the immediate <coughs> prospect of an adjustment of status on the other side of deferred action. The benefits of beneficiaries of DAPA, these are the parents of uh, US citizens or the parents of lawfully permanent residents do not have the immediate prospect of, of any kind of adjustment status on the other side. They may need to wait till the child turns 21, maybe a 10 year bar, maybe they have to re-enter the country to have consular proceedings. There are a lot of barriers that take place before the DAPA beneficiaries can actually get there. So in this sense, a DAPA has not been consistent in the manner in which previous exercises of deferred action have been used. Okay? The second point I want to make about deferred action is has this actually been used for prosecutorial discretion? The president in a memo says over and over again, it's done on a case-by-case -case basis. On a case-by-case -case basis, everything is individualized. Every single immigrant is treated as new. But if we actually look at how this is structured, the secretary and not the agents on the ground are making the decision. The secretary sets very broad policies about who gets it and who doesn't. And what's fascinating is that the grant rate for DACA, depending on how you count it, is roughly 95, 96%, okay? In the, in the litigation, which was mentioned in Texas, the government was not able to mention a single case where a person was denied based on any kind of individualized grounds. Virtually every case was someone who didn't fill the paperwork correctly or didn't met the requisite criteria, or had some sort of gang membership, or maybe had some fraud in the past. Almost everyone who was disqualified was done so because they didn't meet the secretary's criteria. So while they have the pretense of individualized discretion, it's really something of, of, of a veneer, okay? Um, and, and the last point I'd like to make really regards the separation of powers itself. Um, I'm not a fan of immigration policy. I'll make that very clear. I think we should have comprehensive reform. I am very much in favor of it. But Congress didn't do it. And perhaps they should be faulted, perhaps they should be blamed. I'll, I'll, I'll jump on the bandwagon with you. But the fact that Congress said, we do not want to pass a law protecting this class of people. And then a few months later, the person said, I will give benefits to this exact class of people. That should really scare you, right? That should really scare you when a future president, maybe not named Barack Obama, maybe named Ted Cruz, decides to the same philosophy. So say President Ted Cruz decides, you know what, I'm not going to enforce environmental laws in Texas. I use my prosecutorial discretion not to engage in a prosecution. I don't have enough money for this, right? Or you have a President Rick Perry who decides, I'm not going to get any visa to anyone, okay? A faithful adherence to the law is much more important than immigration policy. So while you may appreciate the benefits of this policy, and it will benefit a lot of people, the rule of law is much, much more significant in the long run. I fear greatly that the present speak, the precedents being set now will be used in the future to accomplish goals that I am very much afraid of. Okay? Now, I think I'm right about my time limits, and I will stop here, but we'll have some more time later for questions. Thank you very much.